We are happy to invite the Honorable State Minister of Education, Dr. Surin Raghavan, Ms. Nelly Dlamini, Acting EMIS Manager for the Ministry of Education, Iswatini, Dr. Pamod Amarakun from HISP Sri Lanka, Dr. Kenneth Staring from the University of Oslo to the stage to a panel discussion on information management in education. And thank you to the Honourable State Minister for those very powerful words. I think that uh, key, no key messages of dig digital sovereignty um, are incredibly important for us to reflect on as we move through these two days of conference together. So thank you very much, Honourable State Minister. Because we have the privilege, privilege to have Dr. Suren with us, we wanted to take the opportunity to start for the first day uh, a panel discussion where we can really dive into a few more details around information management systems towards thinking about that vision towards the 2030 agenda. So we know and we, we, are, we believe that we, education is a human right. And we know it's a force for sustainable development and for peace. And this 2030 agenda that's guiding us all, it requires education to empower people with the knowledge, with the skills, and the values to live a life that they have reason to value, to live a life with dignity, to build their lives, but also to contribute to, to our societies. However, today we have more than 262 million children and youth who are out of school. Six out of 10 are not requiring the basic literacy and numeracy skills that we need them to have, after, even after being for several years in, in school. Compounding this, 750 million adults are illiterate. So we're leaving school, we're continuing into life as an adult, illiterate. And ambitions for education are captured in the SDG 4, as we know of the 2030 agenda, which, aim, which helps us to think about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning and opportunities for all by that year of 2030. And there's a roadmap to achieve this which guides us all on how we can turn these commitments into action. So it has seven ad objectives, Education 2030, and it defines a global agenda for us all. But it also offers some guidance for countries and, and challenges us all. And the agenda has a multitude of implications for planning and management of the education sector. So given this, we thought it would be uh, really honored because of this honorable state minister being with us to have a moment to discuss a little bit some of these issues. Um, for example, Honourable State Minister, we know that accessibility and availability of data is a main challenge in the Sri Lanka education sector. So given this background, what do you think are some of the main steps the Ministry of Higher Education is planning to take to overcome this situation? Look, I think your, your question needs to be rephrased, mm. if I'm to be honest with you. It is not so much the access to data. I think Sri Lankan uh, data cost, you know, per uh, gigabyte is comparatively still lower compared to our income level. But is it that, as I mentioned, the first thing, are we willing now for instance a parent allowing a child to study online in Sri Lankan there are two principals here of major schools in Sri Lanka have you done a study with your parents how free they are to allow the children to study on digital won't they just every 15 minutes come and peek and say you know what are you studying I, I'm not sure show us there is a fear no cultural fear Allowing our younger minds, especially you are talking about, uh, but if you come to higher education, that connects again to that cultural, anthropological, uh, you know, gap that we have. Higher education issue is not the student. I'm sorry, I think uh, some, I see videos have been taken, so this will be quoted me in the public, but I'm afraid, not afraid to tell this. 10% of our senior professors are absolutely against this. Reason unknown to us yet. Any reform, they say no. 
they have if you sit down with them they will show you 19 uh, no year 2000 a circular written by ministry of education that stops us doing they'll say uh, year 2012 ministry of finance had written some so if i propose something averagely about five circulars will be on my table how this should not be done what prevents you doing this so i turn all of that and ask them okay give me at least one circular where you have some room that we can do this project so that's our bureaucracy you know let me as a student of political science say bureaucracy is killing us absolutely digitalization is overcoming bureaucracy no basically when the when the western colonizers went to three different parts of the world when they went to the north america which they called uh, erroneously columbus called them indians because he was he, he didn't even know his map he was coming to india but he landed in america they annihilated all of them i lived in canada for 20 years i'm meeting the canadian high commissioner at 12 o'clock for lunch but canadian history is known this annihilated those people because they had a fight, fighting spirit then the same colonizing master went to africa they saw that healthy good bodies are there they made them slaves but what did they do when did they come to south asia and asia they found we had a system we had a medical system we had a rainwater harvesting system we had an accountability we built temples 2000 years ago they found that our system is really a challenge to them so they completely introduced a system to break this system and that is why i was saying that i had 12 people had to sign one person's leave but nothing moves after that so that biasness is there i would say digitalizing the z generation is very creative they want this to be done who is stopping them it is the senior generation which is not willing to change which is having their own biasness so they can say it's political biasness it's cultural biasness it's religious biasness so i think digital education is not only for kids i would suggest a serious senior digital education is needed <laughs> that we have we sit down with policy makers and seniors how to use this digitalization process so that's my main challenge right now i have i thank you thank you so much sir really thank you doctor um I, I think the, the, the raising up the power of youth is such an important aspect and I think we will be discussing this th as we work throughout the, the two days, moving from basic and secondary edu education, thinking about what comes next for the, the young people and generations coming forward. So thank you for that, sir. Um, Ms. Nelly Dlamini, you're from the Ministry of Education es from the Kingdom of Eswatini, acting EMIS manager, and as we look at towards this 2030 agenda you've had some reflections about what you foresee in the education's current approach that there might be some gaps there might be some things lacking so thinking about the way current emis works today and the vision of agenda 2030 do you see any foresee any gaps okay thank you so much sophia um uh, before i answer that i just want to appreciate the insight from the minister um, about digitalization. Yes, it's costly. And yes, it takes for each and every government to change their mindset around that. We've been so used to using paper, paper-based systems that going to the digital platforms uh, has its own fears and uh, uncertainties and also the cost and also the bureaucracy that is involved in the change to do that. As for EMIS and uh, the, the UN agenda for 2030, um, the education management information systems in most of the countries, it's uh, more focused on basic education. We tend to forget about the higher education. We tend to forget about um, TVET or any other skills when we're reporting to that. We just focus on the pre-primary, primary, 
and secondary. Yet when we're saying we're monitoring the state of the education for our countries, we're supposed to look beyond basic education. We're supposed to look at the skills. We're supposed to look at the higher education. In it itself, lifelong learning, what are we doing about it? How are we monitoring about it? And how can we inform our ministries and our policies and also our planners to do better and also to make better decisions for the future? So that is it. We've been traditionally assigned the role of monitoring basic education when we should be extending the scope to other non-formal, is it non-formal education? We should be looking into that. Uh, we should be also looking into the skills that are in our countries and how they are really looking into the economic demands that are there. And we should be looking at the social, uh, social responsibility of what impact education is doing to our society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nelly. And I think this is important as we move ahead. We've had a very limited vision for EMIS. It's been very traditional and very limited. But yet there are a lot of asks. There's a very high bar that has been placed on education management information systems. So hopefully today with all of you in the room, we will be able to unpack some of these, these thoughts and, and see how we can move forward together as a community. And then finally, I'd like to ask a question to both Dr. Pamut and to Dr. Knut, a combined question to see your varying points of view. Um, we've had a look at UNESCO IIEP, who's done some analysis on the good practices towards the 2030 agenda. There seems to be some key lessons learned by countries that have made some progress. And one broad lesson that IIP mentions is that a long-term agenda requires that partners be ready to offer medium or long-term su support, or at least that they have a long-term vision, as Dr. the Honorable uh, State Minister was also mentioning to us in his speech. So can you share how his Sri Lanka and how the University of Oslo envision the support more broadly? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, again, I really want to appreciate the, the, this opportunity to, to um, uh, speak to you all. And I really appreciate the very frank uh, and open uh, speech um, and comments by, by the state minister. Uh, because it, it really is not easy. I think that was one of the main messages. It's not easy and it is also costly. I, I do still want to uh, refer back to the professor's presentation uh, early this morning uh, with his concept of frugal innovation, which I think is, uh, again, not necessarily easy, but, but it's, it's very much the, the ethos that, uh, that the HISP uh, Center at the University of Oslo has been trying to, to um, uh, have as a, as, as a leading uh, slogan for for, for decades now. And I, um, so trying to not just not come in and try and erase things, but try and build and, and bring things together, uh, not focusing on, uh, on silos or, or uh, short-term systems, but trying to think long-term with the government, saying, okay, yes, even within the ministry, there are different departments. They, they don't always freely exchange data because that that is not uh, the administrative culture and that's not uh, easy when everything is on paper, but digitalization gives you that, um, gives you an opportunity, provides a, a, an opportunity to also make organizational changes. But of course we know this is not, it is not very easy. From the University of Oslo, uh, our uh, real um, uh, commitment is to be there for the long term. So this project, as, as Pamud was mentioning, has been working for 30 years in the health sector. Uh, shorter, maybe five, six years now in the education sector, but uh, we, we really don't plan to go away very, very quickly. We, and we're quite good at partnering with uh, some of the funding agencies, etc., especially on, again, in health. Uh, but uh, another way that we really try to look long term is that we've established some, uh, we've worked with um, many universities to, uh, to jointly establish um, 
master uh, level education. So uh, again, a very nice example from the medical university here at the University of Colombo. Um, uh, and also uh, in education now, we're working with uh, the University of the Gambia and uh, CD here from the ministry um, in the Gambia uh, is, is very key to that. So again, we try to have exchange of lectures, students and projects. So to build a long-term uh, um, expertise in the country. And that's really from our point of view, the main thing is build a national expertise as well as, uh, as strong regional teams, which we call the HISP network. Thank you. Yeah, just to build on uh, what Kenut was highlighting, uh, the HISP, the, the objective of the HISP, uh, as he mentioned, we are not really building software, it's more about implementation research. So what we have found in last 30 years of supporting countries is like when it comes to implementing digital technologies, it is not technology that matters. So our approach always has been socio-technical. So as the Honorable Minister highlighted, most of the time why digital systems fail is not because you build bad software in a technological lens. It's more about you, are, you kind of fail to um, uh, establish something in a socio-technical setup. So it's always this socio-technical matters. So it's about like 30% technology. It's more about like the rest of the 70% is all the existing practices in that context. It could be cultural, it could be bureaucratic. It is just about the system. So that is why, like, uh, uh, early today, Professor Vajra Disanayake from, um, uh, I mean, he's, as well as the, uh, the director from the health ministry, they highlighted their long journey. It's been like 15 years. How they started, because they had the same experience. You had different technology company comes, build systems, establish, and in three, four years, there is nobody to maintain it. The ministry does not have the kind of ownership. So that's why when we were trying to implement these systems in the education ministry, what we have been trying to do last three years is build capacity. So build capacity in the ministry core team. That's, that's the key. And then in the subnational levels, so that you have capacity not only to maintain, but also to innovate on top of a platform. So this is the key. If you don't, I mean, so you, you, your question was about what the partners are doing. So we as HISP, uh, not only in Sri Lanka, in all the countries that are present here, what we are trying to do is build systems with the ministry so that, I mean, not to own it. A tech, tech company can't own something. It's a ministry who should own it. Owning doesn't mean like just an agreement. It's about like you need to have control of the system. You should be able to make changes. You should be able to decide what we are trying to implement in a couple of years. And then all the users, not just national, not just the ministry. It should be all the levels. They should have the ownership. That's what actually uh, the Ministry of Health has been trying to do over the last so, so many years. That's why they, they mentioned about this master's program, the doctoral programs, feeding into the uh, health ministry. So they, ha I mean, they get the, their qualification and they have a post in the ministry. Uh, so that's, that's, I mean, like another question, like why, why medical doctors? You need IT staff, but you also need someone with some domain expertise so that you can contextualize the requirements and create that ownership. So that's exactly what we have been trying to do. So that's why things have been quite slow growing uh, uh, in the uh, Ministry of Education. They have been mainly targeting at few key systems, like for example, so the requirements coming from the ministry. So if something is working, you are not uh, replacing it. You kind of try to complement by whatever that is working and then you need to kind of integrate. Otherwise you will have a lot of inf information silos and when the higher administration or the uh, political leadership wants to look at data to make decisions, it's not there. They have to uh, maybe you log into a couple of different systems. So these are some of the practices we are trying to work with the ministry, but it's a long journey. It's not like a couple of months thing. Thank you. May I add uh, one line to uh, what the medical doctor is referring to? I think we need a roadmap time-based roadmap and that roadmap had to be dialogically agreed upon and it had to go beyond the governments in power it's a national policy level had to be agreed upon so it has to be come to the parliament now digitalized in Sri Lanka in 19, 2030 what does it mean what does it mean to the ports authority what does it mean to our airport because we are having two million tourists coming here now we can't even facilitate the the documents so we gave it to a document facilitation center company and they have big aho saying that uh, some other company has taken over the rights of issuing visa to so, so immediate misinformation so this cultural biasness this fear of digitalizing 
and then you know bet me after this conference within 30 days 45 days there will be an article written in singhala against the norwegian government saying that you are the agent trying to rob our data bet me that kind of an article will come onna lankave datta horakam karanda aapau norwegian choddu avilla kiyala anni varren leveno no you have to manage that that's a reality that is that is the ground reality we are not agreeing with them we can't at once make them disappear because they'll come in another form but i think constant engagement with them participate in democratical dialogical manner and we will win democracy will win one day that's my hope i mean she was saying that i didn't hear a country's name i said i only come closer to south africa to meet great mandela close during our peace talks but democracy will win there is no alternative for democracy prajatantravade anivaryama satya katita prithviye dinano no tapite kale gan time so i would say you need to have a road map and the second point is to break your key areas now that's what we are done high education okay we need student data we need academic data we need administrative data we need physical facility data but we broke all those into different pieces and we said okay we are creating a platform where independently all these silos will work but will be interconnected given time 2030 is my uh, target so that's what i i would say my idea is to say i thank you i need to leave now i'm behind schedule so i wish you all the very best to you again right thank you Thank you very much and again we really have been privileged to have you here today so thank you again